to Women's Voices Lunch and Learn. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I'm the executive director. My name is Bruno Williams, and we have a custom of starting our programs with a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we acknowledge that we're on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Osage Nation, Missouri, Illinois Confederacy, and many other tribes who were and are custodians of the land where we reside, occupy, and call home. We recognize their sovereignty was never ceded after unjust removal. We give appreciation to these indigenous people for use of their stolen lands. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm and support tribal sovereignty, history, and experiences by elders past, present, and generations yet to come through their connection to this land. Today, there are over 183,400 Native Americans living in the state of Missouri. We're so glad you're here with us today. Um, Women's Voices is a small nonprofit organization um, in the St. Louis area. Uh, and we, our mission is to identify, research, and discuss critical issues, to mobilize, energize, and inspire ourselves and others to action, to work as individuals and in community for social justice. And we are so pleased that you are here with us today. Um, if you are not already a member or subscriber to our newsletter, we would welcome you to become a member of subscriber um, through our website, or you can email me directly. I will drop those both into the chat. Um, <clears throat> we also operate on donations and we welcome your support. So if you are so moved to give us a donation, we would really welcome that. Um, and just going forward, I would like to introduce Deanna Stevenson, who is our member who has organized this event today and will introduce the program. Thank you, Brenna. And good afternoon to all who are attending. Today, we are doing a Zoom on arts in the forefront of social justice, in which our distinguished speakers will be talking about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how a movement around these principles is truly taking hold of our foremost arts institutions and even at the grassroots level. The DEI movement seeks to address the historically extraordinary absence of black and brown and Asian people, as well as LGBTQIA and women from our cultural canon. And not only from our cultural canon and great institutions, but also from our everyday lives. Many of us go to small venues to hear music, to take part in or enjoy a reading, to see visual art, However, most often, at least in my long life, the work of black artists, brown artists, women, and out LGBTQIA artists' is absence has been excluded. There are most often willful exclusions, a disbarment of the humanity and cultural production of those who are forbidden are thought of as other, as less than. But this discussion is not only about marginalization and an often dark history, it is also about inclusion and the action we need to take and are taking to create equity and involve all of us in the expansive DEI enterprise. Broadening the palette of arts creation, arts administration and participation challenges us to take first steps, if we haven't already, to enter a cultural realm rich in diversity and united by the fulfillment of the pledge we make to honor civil and human rights. Back to you, Brenna. Wonderful. Um, I will be uh, doing the Q&A at the end of the program. If you have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the chat and then I will ask them at the end of the program so everyone can hear them. Um, and I am pleased to welcome Renee Bramell Franklin, Chief Diversity Officer of the St. Louis Arts Museum, Nicole Ambos Freeber, Managing Director of Advancement at Opera St. Louis Theater, and Emily Coring, Executive Director of Bread and Roses, Missouri. All right, I think I am first up. And so I am going to do the tech first and get my um, screen shared. And then I will begin my presentation.
Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're seeing my screen. Advancing change. All right. <laughs> Thank you so very much and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Deanna, and all of the members of the group who arranged for today's program. It is indeed my pleasure to discuss social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion with my colleagues, Nicole and Emily. Today, I will take you on a whirlwind journey through the past, present, and future of the St. Louis Art Museum and our intentionality in which we center equity and justice in our continued efforts to be a welcoming and inclusive institution where everyone feels a sense of belonging. The museum was, fun, uh, was founded in 1879 as the St. Louis School and Museum of Fine Arts, an independent entity within Washington University. Located in downtown St. Louis, it was renamed the City Museum. The current museum in Forest Park was built as a permanent structure named the Palace of the Arts for the 1904 World's Fair. In 1972, the City Museum was renamed the St. Louis Art Museum. A pillar of social justice is that all people, regardless of expertise or privilege, deserve access to equal opportunities and meaningful social participation, including equal access to the arts. Barriers, real or perceived, cannot be ignored and museums must diversify its collections programs, boards, and staffing to better ensure social justice for all. Dedicated to art and free to all was carved and continues to be above the museum's building. But free and accessible are not the same. Brene. Yes. I'm really sorry to interrupt you because I know that we had worked on this before we started. I yep. am not seeing the presentation slide. You are not. Oh, mm -hmm. you should have stopped me earlier. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing. See, I'm tech challenged, guys. I was well, here. We, we did test to... this. <clears throat> we did. Okay. I'm going to close it totally and come back in again. How about that? Sounds good. So I'm going to open. I am going to share screen. I am going to open it up again, share it again. Okay, and it's, it's still... showing on my side. Once again, I'm going to click from the beginning. Are you seeing anything now? It says you are sharing screen. It's still okay. in the, um, with the title at the top and then it wasn't advancing slides on my view. It was it, just on oh the beginning goodness. one. I tell you what, Laura, rather than taking up time, do you want to share for me? because I don't know what I'm doing differently. I will try, let me get it open here. Let me see. I apologize. It worked a few minutes ago, guys. It, did. it sure did. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks for your patience, everybody. So sorry. Mine's opening, it's just a little slow. Okay. All right, well, I apologize. I got on nice and early. We shared our screens and it all worked, but that's technology for you. So not sure what I did differently. So Laura is gonna come to the rescue and she is going so. to <laughs> share her screen. Oh, 
You want me to try it one more time? Sure, because mine is just thinking. <laughs> okay. Share screen. This is my presentation. I click share. It says you are sharing your screen from the beginning. What was the other extra button you pushed last time that made it? I'm not seeing it this time. See if it goes to the next screen. You're not, you're still not there seeing it anything? Do it's not anything? in present mode for us. Okay, but you're seeing something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's progressed. It progressed from the last slide. You might just have to click, click on this manually. Okay. Yeah, I see. Are you seeing something different now? Yeah. I'm yeah. seeing the second slide, third slide. Okay. So, but you're not seeing. It's not going by itself. You have to do it probably. Yeah. But it's not showing. Um... Okay. I don't want to do that. I just click something I don't want to do. Okay, then guys, we're going to wing it here. If you can see the slides, but you're seeing them on the side, are you? Are they even big? No, we're seeing them yes, in the gallery. Okay. Yeah, they're the gallery, you know, slides. So every time you click one, it becomes the big picture. Okay, so then I'll do it like that. I'm going to use my left and my right hand. So we're going to see if I works. can do this quickly. Okay, so basically I was just saying, I'm not gonna repeat because you heard that basically I believe that everyone should have equal access to the arts. And I'm gonna go over here and click. Um, as I said, we have dedicated to art and free to all on the building, but I do believe that being free and being accessible are not the same thing. And conversations about accessibility at the St. Louis Art Museum is not new. And in fact, in 1907, when the City Museum was discussing its move from downtown St. Louis to Forest Park, a group of 25 women formed the Art Museum's Car Line Association. And their concern was, and I quote, the art museum should be within the reach of the masses instead of being convenient only to those with automobiles and carriages. The barriers today may be different, but our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion remains the same. So social justice within the museum must include both outreach and inreach. And you hear about many organizations going out beyond their walls, which is very important. But we also want to make sure that we do in reach. And that is those systemic changes that occur within and throughout an institution. SLAM's vision and its values explicitly include diversity and inclusion as a lens through which social justice can be achieved. To achieve systemic change, we look at all the functions of the art museum and our core principles are to care. That means community collaborations, art, representation, and experiences, which I will highlight very quickly. And I'm gonna go a little bit faster not to impose on my, um, my other panelists time. So for collaborations, we invited museums both in 22 and 23 to come to the museum to learn about our upcoming exhibitions and to look at opportunities to collaborate. So I hope as you look at this list, you will see many of the organizations that we collaborate with. I thought I would highlight just a couple, the Gateway Korea Foundation, Passport to India with Val Bahar, the St. Louis County Library, and Arts and Faith. It's a priority for us to also collaborate with institutions in the metro area that are smaller, historically under-resourced, and engaged in underserved communities. Now let's take a look at art. 
Given that our museum is a global collection with works all around the world created by people from every walk of life, our art is a great foundation from which to build inclusivity in the arts for all. And a quick look back at 2023, when we had the closing of Global Threads, the art and fashion of Indian chintz. The cloth was undeniably beautiful, but the backbreaking inhumane labor to produce the cotton in India and America is far from beautiful. And the labor story was included in this exhibition. Ticketed exhibitions in 2023 that I hope you had an opportunity to um, see and come visit the museum was Age of Armor, Treasures from the Higgin Armory Collection at the Worcester Art Museum, M Monet Mitchell, Painting the French Landscape, Action Abstraction Redefined, Modern Native Art, 1940s to 1970, and The Culture hip hop in the contemporary art in the 21st century. So I hope that you can see the wide breadth and variety of our exhibition schedule. Matisse in the Sea is the first exhibition that will be opening this coming Saturday for the 2024 schedule. And it examines the significance of the sea in Matisse's career and offers an opportunity to explore the artist's travels and global influences that informed his art, particularly African sculpture and mass. The next ticketed, ticketed exhibition is Art and the Imagination in Spanish America, 1500 to 1800, and will feature more than 100 works representing indigenous, European, Asian, and African traditions. We all know that this period is marked by imperial expansion, conquest, colonization, and the transatlantic slave trade, all topics of social justice, or should I say, injustice. In our ongoing efforts to be inclusive, the museum will produce all of its labels for this exhibition in both English and Spanish. Narrative wisdom in African art acknowledges the intersections between certain historical arts and the oral traditions, and it will cover artists from Sub-Saharan Africa during the 13th and the 20th centuries. In addition to the many ticketed and non-ticketed exhibitions, the St. Louis Art Museum has over 35,000 works in its permanent collection. And here are two paintings, Charles I, one painted in 1633 and the other in 2018, hung side by side in the galleries. Wouldn't you like to know what their conversation is all about. I'd now like to talk just very quickly about this teapot that is in our permanent collection. It was crafted in 1817 and came into the museum's collection in 2001. It is on view in our American Decorative Arts Galleries. And when I first arrived at the museum, I took a tour with the American curator in these galleries, the American Decorative Arts Galleries. I looked around the room at all of the art. I saw chairs and cabinets and sofas and glassware and silver vases, but notice that even though I was standing in the American galleries, I did not see any works by African-Americans. I spoke to the curator about the need for our institution to include everyone's story and how art by all Americans would add to the conversation and the experiences of all visitors. About a year later, the curator came to my office to announce that this teapot by African-American artist, Peter Benson was available for sale. Later, I learned that a significant portion of the funds for the teapot were donated by a corporation led by an African-American, 
his first major gift to the museum. So this little teapot started big conversations, conversations between the curator and myself, between the museum and a new donor, and between the museum and visitors. Decisions about the art that is in our galleries to programming are decisions that are made by staff. And it is vital to be intentional about determining who is represented at the table to make those decisions. Min Jung Kim, the Barbara B. Taylor director joined the museum a little over two years ago. And she has made it her a big, she has made a big point to meet staff one-on-one -on -one at every level of the organization and to learn about the many St. Louis communities. Social justice squarely aligns with equitable career opportunities. The upper left-hand corner shows our teen assistant guides. The lower left, two new positions generously funded by the Mellon Foundation to diversify leadership in art museums. The upper right are two of our Romero Bearden Graduate Museum Fellows, a program that is celebrating more than 30 years of mentoring early professionals from historically underrepresented backgrounds. And the lower right is a fellow that is actually employed by the Griot Museum of Black History right here in St. Louis, who is receiving training from our museum conservation staff to enhance his conservation skills. Experiences, the museum tries and strives to engage visitors of all ages and interest levels inside the museum as well as beyond its walls. We offer numerous on-site programming and we are actually very excited that we've received a multi-year grant from Art Bridges and will be piloting Access for All Free Fridays to welcome new audiences and increase access to the museum. No one can speak of social justice more than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We have more than 100 photographs by Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, Manita Slee, who documented the civil rights movement. The artwork in the middle is by Fritz Scholder, titled American Landscape, Second State. Born of native descent, he was determined to broaden the understanding of what and who defines Native American art. The work on the right is The Breaking of the Vessel by Ansel Kiefer, Kiefer and is a bookcase that recalls the night of the broken glass in Germany when synagogue windows and Jewish owned storefronts were smashed and books were burned. I want to leave you today with a few upcoming programs. Art in Bloom, the museum's annual celebrations of flower, flowers and art imaginatively interpreted by florists in St. Louis will be throughout our galleries. The painting behind the ladies looking at the, um, the flower arrangement is entitled Watts 1963, and it is by Carrie James Marshall. The artist is directly addressing civil and social aspirations of African-Americans migrating from the South for more equitable opportunities. The Art Museum with its global collection is the perfect location to host a naturalization ceremony to welcome new citizens to America. And we hope that you might join us on April 26 for that ceremony. And I conclude where I started, advancing change. The museum is committed to advancing change in the arts and hosts an annual diversity summit focused on topics of diversity and justice with national renowned speakers. Again, we hope that you will join us and we invite you to the museum and to join any one of the programs that I have talked about today. Once again, I 
apologize for the technical different difficulties, but I thank you for your time. I am going to stop sharing and turn it over to Nicole, I believe is next up. I think I am. Thank you so much, Renee. And thank you for your grace under technology pressure. That is always my worst nightmare. So uh, we will see how this goes. Okay. I am hopeful you are seeing my screen. Can someone You're give me a, a thumbs pro. up? You did. Okay. <laughs> You never know. Uh, thank you all so much for the invitation to be with you today. I'm so glad to know this group exists, which I was not aware of previously. So thank you, Deanna. Uh, and I'm also so glad to be in the company of Renee and Emily, whose work and whose organizations I admire so much. Uh, as we get started, let's see if I can get this to advance. Um, I just wanted to share a quick snapshot of Opera Theater for those of you who may not be familiar with our company. So we are celebrating our 49th season this year. We produce a nationally acclaimed season each spring with a mix of repertory that includes beloved classic works like the Barber of Seville and La Boheme this year, uh, some rarities. So this year we'll have Handel's Galileo, or excuse me, Handel's Julius Caesar and more contemporary works, which this year will include Galileo Galilei by Philip Glass. Our focus is really on talent development. We identify and nurture the finest young singers, artisans, and arts administrators in the country. So when you come to Opera Theater, you really have that excitement of discovering someone who is just starting an incredible career. By way of example, to just illustrate this, we have about 1,100 singers who apply each year for our Young Artist Program. We audition 400 in seven cities across the country and about 30 are selected. So it's a highly competitive uh, industry to be part of. And we're really focused at Opera Theater on creating an opera experience that is welcoming to everyone. The head of Opera America, which is our national service organization for opera companies, likes to call Opera Theater the most radically democratic opera company in the country. Uh, we perform everything in English. We offer 50 free tickets to every performance. And our theater is surrounded by a beautiful garden where we invite artists and audiences to come together. As we think about Opera Theater's role in social justice, I think about what is the change that we as a company are trying to create in the world. And our impact really focuses on these three areas. We change careers by serving as an incubator for young talent. We change our community by providing opportunities for dialogue around the stories that we share on stage. And we try to change the canon of opera to ensure that audiences see themselves reflected in the work that we produce. Unfortunately, our time is limited today, so I'm not gonna go through all three of these, uh, but happy to talk in the question period if you have questions about this. On the career front, just to say, we really think of ourselves as a pipeline for talent in all aspects of opera, not just for Opera Theater of St. Louis, but for the industry. So we think about that very carefully as we go through our EDI work. And um, I'm happy to talk, as I said, more about recruitment and some of the strategies that we're trying on that front. But I'm, I want to focus today on community and on changing the canon of opera. As we think about community, I came across this quote recently by David Brooks, and I just love this idea that the arts help us understand those around us. And I think that's why so many of us seek out the arts experience. And by using the stories we tell on stage, we can encourage conversations around issues that matter to our region. In a community that feels so disparate as St. Louis often seems to feel, our ability to create connection is really important. And this idea of being a convener really began for us around 2010. Um, and I think I saw Bhatia on the, on the call today. I hope she's with us because she was really instrumental in this work. In 2010, we were planning a production of John Adams' opera, The Death of Klinghoffer, which tells the true story of Leon Klinghoffer, a Jewish American man who was murdered by Palestinians on a cruise ship. And we knew this opera had the potential to cause controversy. It had caused controversy when it debuted elsewhere. But instead, we use this as an opportunity to begin a conversation with faith leaders, engaging with Jewish, Islamic, and Christian faith leaders about the themes of the opera. Everyone in that group really worked to build relationships and trust and to find points of common humanity. 
As the Post-Dispatch wrote, I love this quote, this felt like an outbreak of interfaith understanding and civility. And goodness knows we could all use a little bit more of that in the US right now. This effort felt like progress, so we really decided to dig into it and continue. The group of original faith leaders expanded and evolved into what today is our Community Engagement and Inclusion Council. And you can see a little bit more about their charge here. They've guided us as we've addressed questions focused not just on religion, but on race, gender, and sexual identity throughout the years. This group has been invaluable to us. They help us connect to St. Louis organizations and individuals who we might not otherwise know, and they're not afraid of delivering hard truths when needed. But at the end of the day, this is really also about what we put on stage. The first known opera was composed in the year 1600. So the art form's been with us for centuries, but we believe opera should be a living, breathing art form, something that feels as relevant today as it did in the 17th centuries. And one of the ways we do this is by commissioning opera. This has been, as you can see, part of our company's DNA since the earliest days. Our first commission was in year three of opera theater's existence. And by our 50th anniversary next year, you can see the stats of the works that we have premiered here in St. Louis. The cost to commission a world premiere is often upwards of a million dollars. We are so fortunate that our board of directors encourages us to take this kind of calculated risk that we have a donor community that supports it financially, and we have an audience that shows up to experience these works. But with this privilege, we feel comes great responsibility. So when we make this kind of investment in commissioning, we think very, art very carefully about the artists we're commissioning and the stories that we're putting on stage. Um, some of you may be familiar with this work, Fire Shut Up in My Bones, which is a work we premiered in St. Louis in 2019 and the Metropolitan Opera debuted in 2021. It's based on the book of the same name by Charles Blow and tells the story of the sexual abuse he suffered as a child. When the Met produced this opera in 2021, after we did it here in 19, it was the first time they had staged an opera by a black composer. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a minute. This is the Metropolitan Opera, the largest opera company in the country. 2021 was the first time they'd had a work by a black composer on stage. And while our work, there's still much work to be done in St. Louis. We by no means are finished or have done enough, but these are the artists we've commissioned throughout the years, the BIPOC artists who work you've seen in St. Louis. And there's much more work to do here. Is it enough? No. Will it be complete? Never. Uh, but even as we think about this, we're also thinking about other kinds of not just race, but other stories that we're putting on stage. In 2022, we did a production of Harvey Milk to highlight Milk's story of activism. This year, we'll offer Galileo Galilei to examine how science and religion intersect. And we'll have a world premiere in 2025 by Lynn Mattage that addresses this question of displacement. But we're always thinking about what else can we do? How else can we broaden the pathway to opera for artists and audiences? And that leads us to the New Works Collective. So what is the New Works Collective? This is a three-year commissioning cycle designed to push the boundaries of opera by welcoming new creators and new decision makers. And it's this decision maker part of this equation that's really interesting. This initiative is guided by our collective. This is a group of 10 St. Louis community members who shape an open call for commissions. They review submissions and they annually select three projects for development and production. This initiative actually grew out of a question from that community engagement and inclusion council. The council members each year, we share with them the works that are coming up in our season and they help us figure out how we can connect those productions to community members and community organizations. And one year, one of the members of that group said to us, but why do you always get to decide the operas? Why do you get to pick? And of course, our um, uh, initial instinct was exactly the wrong answer, which is, you know, that's how we've always done it. That's how every opera company does it. And that was not the answer we gave. We stopped a minute and said, well, let us think about that idea. And as we began to mull it over, we began to ask, what if? What if we were to invite the community into this decision-making process? What if we were to make more room at the table, which is something that doesn't happen a whole lot in opera? So in 2022, we invited a group of 10 community members to form the collective. They are a mix of musicians, artists, writers, activists. They come from backgrounds we don't traditionally see represented in opera. 
Many of them will tell you that they don't know anything about producing opera. I would argue after three years, that's not true. But they came together to shape an open call and to invite applications from local and national artists. And these are the applicant pools that we've seen during the three years of this selection process. Uh, for those of you who aren't that familiar with opera, we don't see numbers like this very often in the opera world. We see a much wider, much narrower pool. Um, but these were what our applicant pools look like through that open call process. The collective has questioned everything and they've tried to move every barrier to participation they could think of. And I wanna show you a little bit of the work that resulted because I think this work speaks for itself. Our first year of productions was in March of 2023. And what I'm about to show you is one of the three works entitled Slanted, an American rock opera. This tells the true story of the Slants, an Asian American band that tried to trademark its band name. And they were told by the legal system that the Slants could not be registered because it was derogatory. The case ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court where the band was victorious. And then of course they did what anyone would do. They decided to write an opera about their experience. Here is an excerpt, and actually, I think I have screwed up my own technology, Renee, so I'm gonna stop for one second here. And I am gonna reshare, because I think I didn't check the audio and video boxes, and I wanna make sure you could actually hear this work. Whoops, and that's the wrong. Give me one more second. Okay, so hopefully you can both see and hear. Growing up high, Oops. I was told play my part, stay in my role. If I could step into my dreams, what would they hold? Never stepped out of line, minimize and stay quiet. If I was given a chance, would I have braved the fight? To be seen, choose my identity. To be heard and to stand undeterred. Instead of letting others define me, could I be reassured of who I can be? No, that is not me that you are speaking of. No, you don't know our community. Just pure irony that in this court I'm fighting for freedom of speech and no. I hope you all could hear that. I had. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> My screen was doing something odd as well. So um, just to continue on, that was one of the three stories that the collective chose last year. 
the other two works were Cook Shack, which told the story of a young black girl who discovers her own superpower when she learns about three black female inventors and Madison Lodge, which told the story of drag ball culture uh, in the Harlem Renaissance. Are these your usual operatic stories? No. Did they resonate deeply with audiences? Yes. This year's productions will be on March 14th, 15th, and 16th, and they feature stories that are equally compelling. The first is Unbroken, a work by North St. Louis native and composer Ronald Ruiz and librettist J. May Barizzo. This tells the story of the resilient journey of Grace, a single mother who loves her children fiercely, but she wants to prepare them for a future without her because she has lung disease. This is Ron's true life story. The second opera is Mechanisms, which explores the challenges of a neurodivergent child and her parents who must embrace a new way of learning. And we'll close with On My Mind, a platonic love story between two Black women who discover the strength of adult friendship. And as we think about how changing the decision makers changes, changes our programming decisions, I want to share a story with you about this opera, On My Mind. The composer and librettist of this work are Jasmine Barnes and Deborah Deep Mutam. The collective loved their application, and they loved the energy this team gave off during the interview, interview process. But the collective, our community members making the decision, didn't love the story that they proposed. The story they proposed originally was the tale of captive West Africans who chose to drown themselves instead of being enslaved by American owners. And the collective liked the team, but they said, we don't want to put trauma on stage. And the collective was in the driver's seat. So they asked, are there other stories you want to tell? And Deborah and Jasmine came back to us and said, well, we're interested in telling the story of our friendship. We met when we were both caregivers for family members and our new friendship was the lifeline for us through that time. And the collective immediately said, yes, that's the story we want you to tell. And Jasmine and Deborah said something that I will never forget. And that was, we weren't sure that this story was important enough for opera. Their story, their real life story, didn't seem important enough for them to write opera about. And I would argue that's what we're trying to change. All stories matter. Representation matters. The decision makers matter. And until we get to the point where all people can see themselves on stage, then we still have work to do. I hope you'll join us this year for the New Works Collective. Again, we're March 14th, 15th, and 16th at the Kirkwood Performing Arts Center. We would love to see you there. And I just appreciate your time today and we'll turn things over to Emily. Okay, wow, thank you, Nicole. That was really so cool to hear about all of that. <clears throat> um, I'm sharing, okay, can everyone see? Thumbs up, okay, good. Um, so I just got, uh, oh, well, let's let it go. Okay, I'm Emily Coring. Um, I'm so excited to uh, share with you the work of Bread and Roses. We are certainly um, the newest and also the smallest of the three organizations speaking today. Um, by far, we are a very grassroots um, arts and social justice organization. I'm happy to tell you about the work. Um, Bread and Roses Missouri began under the umbrella of Missouri Jobs with Justice, which is a workers' rights organization probably a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it was the brainchild of labor organizer Joan Suarez, who I think is on this um, webinar right now listening in. Um, Joan uh, is, a, I think she's a legend um, and a very well-known labor organizer, but she also um, recognized the role the arts have played historically in advancing both the U.S. labor movement and the civil rights movement. So she envisioned an arts organization in that great tradition. So Red and Roses um, began producing projects under the umbrella of Missouri Jobs with Justice, but then moved out and became its own 501c3 organization in 2015. Um, Joan was the executive director until uh, she retired um, in, I can't remember what year it was, but I became the executive director in 2022 um, and the first full-time employee. So um, Bread and Roses, Missouri, um, we amplify and elevate the stories of working people through art performance and activism. And we like to say we work at the intersection of the arts and social justice. And we are particularly interested 
in um, workers' rights issues and amplifying and elevating the stories of those people who are often left out, frankly, of arts experiences, both as participants and also in seeing their stories on stage. Oh, I'm not advancing. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so um, these are some of our core values. Um, we value the arts, obviously, and we are a multidisciplinary arts organization. We work in a variety of art forms, including visual art and the performing arts. Um, we believe in action, so not just putting the art on stage, but also then what is the call to action after? What are we trying to change or move forward in the work that we're creating? Um, creativity and access to creativity is very important to us. Um, who gets to experience and have access to creativity is a question that we're always asking ourselves. Um, connectivity, um, helping people, especially workers, feel that they're part of a creative community. Um, the dignity of labor economic equity and we also feel that economic equity is uh you is cannot be exclusive from racial justice they are um you cannot have one without the other there's no economic justice without racial justice so we um certainly um spend much time thinking and operating through the lens of equity um and then to empower people um, who are in the working class from across all spectrums um, of, of race, of gender, of sexual orientation, identity, um, and um, whose stories are we telling is always um, a, the question that we're thinking through. Um, so we do lots of different kinds of projects. Um, I'm going to describe a few. This is one we did actually before I came to Bread and Roses in 2022. But, um, we did this exhibit, Art is Labor, in December 2019 at the Webster Arcade Contemporary Projects Gallery. Um, it featured St. Louis-based artists, primarily an artwork um, that was labor-themed. So this um, exhibit was focused around the idea that art is work and art is labor. Um, and one of our um, one of the things that is very important to us in our work is that artists are fairly compensated for the work that they do. Most artists are part of the working class, um, and their work deserves um, to be fairly compensated so that they can make a living at what they do. Because um, I, I know a lot of artists, and they are very hardworking people, um, who are often asked to work for um, less than their worst or worth or even worse for exposure. And most artists I know don't need more exposure. They need to make a living. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about um, two of our primary um, arms um, that we have going on right now. One is our workers theater project. And then I'm also gonna talk briefly about our youth initiative because we also work with young people. Um, but I'm going to start with the Workers Theater Project. So um, in this project, we tell the stories of and the history of working class people, and it is often performed by workers. Um, workers Theater Projects include original commissioned plays um, and also uh, our workers opera, which I'll describe a little bit um, in a moment here. So um, one project we did recently uh, was Mrs. Palmer's Honey which was a play um, based on a novel by Fanny Cook. And it was commissioned um, by the, from the playwright Cassandra Medley, who I believe is based in Chicago. Um, this play, uh, we were making plans to produce an adaptation of this. It's an out of print book and a hard to find novel, but our founder, Joan, um, read it and then fell in love with the idea of creating a play. Um, this, it's a St. Louis based novel and story um, and it tells uh, the story of Honey Hoop, who's a young black maid who um, rises from being a domestic worker to becoming a union organizer in a factory in St. Louis during the 40s. And it takes place in the Ville neighborhood. Um, so um, we had funding secured to produce the play. It was going to be a live stage production. And then the pandemic hit and plans had to change. So the team um, that was um, producing Mrs. Palmer's Honey got creative and decided, well, maybe this would work as a radio play. And so um, Kathy Bentley, who is the director, and Colin McLaughlin, 
who um, wrote the music for the play um, and working with Cassandra adapted it into a radio play. And then uh, we looked for a platform to put the play on and ultimately KDHX um, agreed to put it on their platform. It premiered in 2023 as an eight episode podcast and you can still listen to all eight episodes on Spotify. Um, and it's very engaging. It's some of, um, we got some of the best actors in St. Louis um, involved in uh, making this radio play. And you can still go listen to it um, as soon as this webinar is over. So um, we also produced a play, um, Jailbird, by Colin McLaughlin, who's a frequent collaborator of Bread and Roses. He's a local playwright, actor, um, and activist, very involved and interested in workers' rights. And we produced this play. Um, about Eugene Debs, who was a radical labor organizer um, in the early 20th century, who ran for president from a prison cell. And we told his story at the Missouri, Missouri History Museum um, back before the pandemic. And that was, um, I believe, the first full play that we did. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my favorite, one of my favorite projects we do, which is the Workers' Opera. And what's unique about the workers opera um, is that it is workers on stage, some of who have never been on stage before, and some of who by now have been in multiple workers operas because they love it so much. Um, some of our workers opera members are in unions, some of them are union organizers, um, some of them work fast food jobs, some of them have been involved in the fight for 15. Um, they come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, but what they have in common is they are all very passionate about workers' rights, and they want to talk about it and tell stories about it on stage. So we gather them with a professional playwright, usually a, we call them a writing facilitator because the uh, workers do some of the writing too, it's not just the playwright. Um, and we have a professional director and they work over a period of time with the workers in a rehearsal process where they start with telling each other their stories, deciding which stories would be great to put on stage. Um, they also work with a musician. We usually integrate music into the workers' opera, sometimes poetry, monologues, and scenes. They rehearse it over several weeks, and then they perform it. Um, so it's, in, it's their stories and their voices. Um, so this, the pictures you're seeing right now are from um, the first workers opera we did after the pandemic, um, which was in 2022 at the Gaslight Theater. Um, that one was called Our Stories United Will Never Be Divided. Um, and then last May, um, we uh, were contacted by the Missouri Workers Center early that year. And um, they asked us if we'd be interested in working on a workers opera with the Amazon STL-8 organizing committee, who uh, you may have um, heard about them because they are, they've been in the media quite a bit with their organizing efforts at um, the STL-8 warehouse, which is in St. Peter's. Um, so we thought that was a really intriguing idea to be able to tell their stories about their struggles, which are largely about the safety of the warehouse um, out there. It is also, of course, about wages, but um, Amazon warehouses are dangerous places to work and, and people are dying there in them and getting seriously injured and Amazon doesn't care. Um, so we started with story circles with our writer and director, Mariah Richardson. We came out and talked to the SDL8 organizing committee and we invited whoever wanted to, to be part of this workers opera. So we ultimately um, had five uh, members of the STL-8 organizing committee, um, along with some of our previous workers opera participants. Um, so we had a total of 12 workers. And uh, at the, uh, we, our venue that time, because we like to perform in places that are non-traditional theater spaces too, that are accessible to lots of people who don't traditionally see themselves as theater goers. We did this workers opera at the Communications of America, Workers of America 6300 Union Hall, which is up in Westport. We both rehearsed and performed it there. 
Um, and this is from the opening of this worker's opera. Um, they had something to say about Jeff Bezos, so they had to include his picture too um, <laughs> in, the, in the play. Um, Jeff Bezos probably would not have liked our worker's opera very much, um, but it was seen um, not only by a live audience, but it was also streamed by the Missouri Workers Center live um, and was seen by many hundreds of people across the country too. Um, so these are uh, just some quotes from some of our participants um, who've been in, all, all three of these people who have been in multiple workers operas. Um, it, it's not only a wonderful opportunity for the audience to understand some things they may not understand about what it's like to be a member of the working class and to work at a job that uh, where there are many, many challenges, um, but also for the workers themselves. Um, it's an extraordinary opportunity for them to do something that they don't get to do very often, which is be in, involved in a collaborative and creative process with a group of artists. And we treat them all as artists and we also pay them. Every worker who's in the workers opera is paid for their time in rehearsal and performance. Um, and it's had a, a profound impact, I think, on, on many of our workers who participated. Um, this is a play that, uh, this was our most recent project, 1877 by Colin McLaughlin. Um, this was an original play that we produced um, about the general strike of 1877, which was an event that happened in St. Louis that a lot of people don't know about, but a lot more people know about it now. Um, we partnered with the Missouri Historical Society or Missouri History Museum. They were wonderful partners. Um, we had almost a thousand people see the performance over six performances, which was our largest um, uh, audience to date to see this wonderful play with music that Colin created that told the stories of how um, both black workers and white workers across a variety of trades and industries in St. Louis all came together for a five day general strike in 1877 to all band together to fight for workers' rights. And a strike like that has not happened since in the United States. Um, so it was an exciting story to tell for us. Um, those are more pictures from 1877. Oh my goodness. Um, upcoming, <laughs> I see we're running short on time. Am I okay? To, to, if I take like two more minutes, am I okay? You're, you're doing well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, upcoming projects we are doing, we're doing a social justice short play festival with our frequent um, friend, our friends and frequent collaborators to Call to Conscience Interactive Theater for Social Change. Um, that will be at the Greenfinch Theater in April and stay tuned for ticket information. Um, and another project that we're working on right now, we're calling it the Caregiving Project, the working title. Um, it is based on the idea that caregiving is work, but caregiving is often unpaid labor, especially for women. Um, when it is paid is low pay and few benefits um, and often done by women of color and the lack of support for caregiving in the workforce is a crisis. So we are creating a community generated play based on the stories of caregivers. We are currently right now in the process of soliciting stories from caregivers, both paid and unpaid across the St. Louis area. Um, our playwright, Mariah Richardson, um, is collecting those stories that she's going to um, fashion into a play that will be performed by, we believe, three actors and will be able to be performed in a variety of locations to generate a dialogue about caregivers who are often invisible in our society. Um, people who take care of young children, people who take care of elders, people who take care of family members who have disabilities and people who are paid to do that care. Um, we want to highlight their stories. Um, it'll also be um, feature a companion art making workshop led by Louisa Otero Prado, who's our youth programs coordinator and an incredible artist herself. One of the reasons we chose these three artists, Mariah Richardson, Jacqueline Thompson, and Louisa Otero Prada to lead this project is because they are all three themselves caregivers and have played caregiving roles to family members. Um, so they connect very strongly to what we're doing. Um, you can tell us your caregiving story too by scanning this QR code and filling out the form. Um, and we would love to be in touch with you to hear your story. 
Um, and I'll leave that up for just one second if you want to grab it, but you can also, I can also send this out later as a follow up. Um, or go to our website. We also really quick, we also have a summer youth initiative um, that uh, where we send professional artists out to now last summer it was 22 sites in St. Louis city and county um, to work with youth in underserved neighborhoods um, where uh, it, we work at summer recreation sites and St. Louis County libraries. The focus of our program is to um, give kids the opportunity in the summer to have high quality art lessons with professional artists. Our lessons promote the health and well being of young people and also encourage young people as community change agents. Our curriculum intentionally weaves social justice and the arts. We introduce um, young people to artists who are change, change agents and activists. Um, both the teachers and um, well-known artists and activists. Um, and also we introduce them to the idea that there is a labor movement and there is a, there was a civil and is a civil rights movement ongoing and that they can use the arts to make change in their communities. These are just some, this is a wonderful self-portrait project that the young people do in the summer. This is an incredible mural that was uh, created by our summer students last summer at North County Recreation Center with the artists. If you ever go to North County Recreation Center and walk in, it is right inside the front door and takes up an entire wall. And every single bit of it was designed and created and painted by the young people. Um, so we're, we're really excited about it. Those are some of the very engaged students painting on the mural. Um, that they designed. Um, these are just some pictures from some of our programs, both our Workers' Opera, Workers' Theater Project, and Youth Initiative. And I'm going to stop there because I know that it is already one o'clock. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work. Red Roses is doing at the intersection of arts and social justice. Thank I'm you so sure. much, um, <clears throat> Renee, Nicole, and Emily. We don't have too many questions, but we do have a few. Um, Karen asked about the free opera tickets and how they were distributed, and Nicole dropped a link into the chat about that. So if you want to scroll up just a little bit, you will see the link. And then she also asked um, where you can learn about Workers Opera Productions. And Emily talked a little bit about it, but I am dropping their news and events link um, mm -hmm. into the chat as well. And on that page, you can sign up for their newsletter and they will share the upcoming information to you. Um, we just have a few questions. Um, one is for all three speakers. Um, and Lynn Lupo is just curious if you had backlash as a result of your DEI policies. So um, maybe just if you have like a short story to tell if, if that's something that's happening or if there's a positive story to tell about the, the result of your DEI policies. Um, have bad things happened? I'll just really briefly say, I'm not gonna call out this funder because it wouldn't be appropriate right now, but we are having a conflict with a funder currently who doesn't wanna fund our work because he feels it is too controversial. Um, so <laughs> our work is, yeah, our, our, you know, we talk about things that veer into the political. We know what the line is with between lobbying and advocacy, but sometimes it can be uncomfortable for funders to think about funding our work. Nicole or Emily, do you have any, or Nicole or Renee, do you have any backlash stories that you'd be willing to share or? I mean, I think we occasionally get, um, you know, an audience survey comment that's <clears> like, <throat> why are you producing so much woke opera? Um, but I think there's so much more positive and those those comment the negative comments tend to stick with you because they are painful and uncomfortable. But it's such a small small percentage of what we're seeing, and so much more positive response. I think. 
Yeah, I would agree with Nicole. We definitely get negative comments about a work of art or a program, but I think they're far and few between. I think that most people come into an institution um, with grace and they want to ex um, be in an a situation where they're hearing from others. I would say, out, you know, separating from the art museum, I would say that I think black and brown people across this country are getting a lot of backlash in general. Um, I just think that our country is at a place that um, we're not giving each other the grace that we need. So um, I'm happy for um, organizations like this that have discussions and, um, you know, your land acknowledgement beginning. I think those are all positives, but um, outside of the art museum, I do think that our country has a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Um, this one is for Emily. Have you um, ever considered a production or do you know of any productions about workers with disabilities and their struggle to get fair wages and equal opportunities to get work? This is from Liz. I love the suggestion. We have not done uh, a work that is intentionally focused on that topic, but it, sh it should be a future work for sure. And then just another related question. What about the documentation of undocumented people who contribute so much to our economy? Both of those, yes. <laughs> those are wonderful suggestions, yeah. And yeah, our, we usually pick a focus for our workers' opera. Um, and I'm writing both those down because those both would be very important topics. So I think that I caught all the questions in um, in the chat. Yep. Um, thank you so much to our, our guest speakers, Renee, Nicole, and Emily, and thank you to all who joined us today. This was wonderful. Um, it's great to learn about the hard work um, that the the arts are, are doing in St. Louis um, and just really novel work as well. I mean, it just sounds like it's the birthplace of some some great things happening. So we are very, very grateful and, and grateful to, to share what you are doing with this audience. Thank, Thank you very you. much for having us. Thank we you very much. It. Thank you.